Now we have a reading from Matthew uh, 5, 17, and 18. Again, think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I didn't come to, to destroy, but to fulfill. And heaven and earth won't pass away till one jot or tittle pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. That's We read that in our liturgy. So I'm just kind of emphasizing that's what we're seeing on the slides. Jesus did indeed bring the law to its fullest intended meaning and expression. The Greek word pleiro, which is fulfill in Matthew 5, 17, simply means to fill to the top to make full, to bring to realization. Contrary to popular Christian teaching, God's Torah never commanded or expected sinless perfection, else the sacrifices for sin would be meaningless. However, in Messiah, we are in fact supposed to strive towards perfection in this life until we one day finally put it on for eternity. Therefore, in this life, and while the temple stood in Jerusalem, true obedience to Torah included bringing sacrifices when a person sinned. Thus, the Torah actually anticipates our failure to keep it from time to time by making provision for our shortcomings. You can read Galatians 3.19 to catch the theology that I'm explaining there. Without expecting sinless perfection, the Torah nevertheless does consider even a single breach to be guilty of violating the whole. Thus, to break one commandment was to be guilty of breaking them all. Recall Jacob, James 2, verse 10. And since the final payment for sin would have demanded the final death of the sinner, per Ezekiel 18.20, Yeshua actually paid this price by dying in our place, thus fulfilling the payment required by the Torah. Of course, we're talking about substitutionary atonement. What does that look like? We've got this sin debt on our back. It's quite heavy. But then Yeshua comes along and stamps it paid in full. Right? That sin debt has been paid. Amen? Amen. But Yeshua's words here in Matthew carry an additional meaning as evidenced by his own explanation of verses 18 to 20, and indeed the rest of the Sermon on the Mount carries this extended meaning as well. So let's, let's kind of go through that. That's what we're going to do a little later. In the following verses, the Master plainly reveals that all of the Torah must eventually be fulfilled and even implies that true followers of God will carry out this fulfillment by doing and teaching others to do even the least of the commandments. We'll read that a little bit later on. After all, just because Yeshua obeyed the Torah perfectly, this doesn't excuse believers from remaining obedient to its commandments. Make sense? On the contrary, now that we have a perfect example of Torah obedience to emulate, we too, by the power of the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, can and should pursue Torah obedience and teach others to do so if we wish to be obedient to the Master's words here in Matthew. That's of course what Paul had in mind, right? So what exactly got nailed to the cross if it was not the Torah? Paul explains in Colossians 2.14 that it was the certificate of our debt, our ultimate failure to pay for our sins, that was nailed to the cross. It was not the Torah that was nailed to the cross. As we follow this, this what we're talking about tonight. We owed God a debt that we could not pay because the payment demanded a sinless sacrifice, a payment we could never make on our own. This accords with the Torah, which actually adjudicates penalties for unrepentant sinners. By Yeshua's blood, those penalties, those debts, they've been paid in full and have satisfied God's courtroom ledger. Those are the things that have been nailed to the cross. There's that, that bill with the, you know, that we owed. Elsewhere in Romans, Paul teaches that because believers had died to sin in Yeshua, the ultimate penalty for sin, death, no longer applies to us. Jesus nailed those penalties of the Torah that were reserved for unrepentant sinners to his cross. Amen. I'm glad he did.